I am on me too. All right. Welcome to the uh, Ask Anything about the recent EHT release of the image of Sagittarius A star, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of our very own galaxy. Um, my name is Teddy Oki. Uh, I am with the EPO team at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory here in Charlottesville, Virginia. With me today, I have three, three very special guests. I'll begin by introducing them. Uh, Kamaljit Saini received his bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering from the Birla Institute of Technology in India. He received a master's degree as well as a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Virginia with a specialization in the field of millimeter wave devices. He is currently employed at the NRAO's Central Development Laboratory, where he serves as its deputy, deputy assistant director. His areas of interest include microwave and millimeter wave devices and design, local oscillators, RFI mitigation, receiver system architecture, and systems engineering. Anthony, Anthony Remigen is the assistant director for science support and research at NRAO. Dr. Remigen received his PhD in astronomy uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2003. As a researcher, Dr. Remigen has an ob observational astrochemist and is presently investigating the molecular composition and distribution of astronomical sources using high-powered radio astronomy facilities, such as ALMA, the Very Large Array, NSF Screenmake Observatory, the ARO 12mm, the Submillimeter Array, and SOFIA. And as of yesterday, he now works as the Assistant Director of Science Support and Research for the NRAO. Finally, Bert Hawkins joined NRAO in 2017 after spending five years as the Director of Science and Technology of the Science and Technology Directorate at the U.S. Army Ground Intelligence Center, where he led a team of over 300 scientists, engineers, analysts, and support personnel located in Virginia, Maryland, and various centers across the world. His experience crosses several disciplines, including millimeter, submillimeter, sub infrared, and acoustic te technology development and analysis foreign R&D and weapons slash systems performance and radar characterization of physical objects. Hawkins brought expertise to NRAO Central Development Laboratory in microwave, radar, and related technologies combined with significant leadership and lab management experience. Uh, so a big welcome to all three of our very special guests today. Um, so we're going to open with, uh, we're going to start bringing some more questions. The first one uh, is a very, well, is it more a bit of an introduction to radio astronomy? And it asks if this picture is visible, is invisible light or a different wavelength. Basically, if I were to somehow get near Sagittarius A star, which is the black hole seen here, would this be what I see at a certain angle? Uh, this is for uh, Dr. Saini or Dr. Hawkins. Okay, I can start us off. Um, so no, so this picture is not invisible light. Um, visible light is obviously the most uh, common way in which we perceive things, and. Uh, you know, since ancient times, of course, you know, we are used, people are used to thinking about telescopes as optical telescopes. Um, and, and we are ourselves also familiar with looking through them through our high school telescopes and, uh, you know, uh, things of that nature. However, um, as everybody in the audience might be familiar that um, optical light is not the only way to, you know, see things. So for instance, when you're driving in your car and you are you know, driving through some fogged up area, you cannot see, but, but uh, your, your, your um, you know, lane, lane keeping assist system and your uh, uh, adaptive cruise control have no problem in continuing through the fog. So clearly there are other ways of you know, looking at objects. So, um, so this is one such image where we are actually making this image at uh, radio frequency. So why radio frequencies? So as you, as everybody is probably familiar, like if you turn on your, uh, uh, you know, cooking range, then before it becomes glowing red hot and you can actually see it, uh, you can put your hand up against it and uh, you can, you know, feel the heat on the back of your hand. So clearly there is something coming, coming from, uh, from from the cooking range that you cannot yet see, but yet it is emitting something. So it is that something that we use to make uh, images. So so depending upon the temperature of the object, anything in the universe uh, emits at uh, lower uh, temperatures uh, radio waves, then higher temperatures microwaves, then infrared, then visible light that we're all used to seeing. And then of course there is ultraviolet X-ray and gamma ray. So not all of these wavelengths actually make through make, make themselves through the atmosphere. Some of them get blocked by the atmosphere. And we only get to see you know, parts of the visible spectrum, some part of the infrared spectrum, some part of the microwave spectrum, and mostly radio waves. So that's what we use, uh, use to make images. 
uh, and uh, the the image that that we see here uh, is 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 made at about uh, 1.2 or 1.3 millimeter wavelength uh, that corresponds to about 230 gigahertz with the gigahertz being uh, a billion uh, oscillations of the E field per second. So it's significantly higher than the frequencies of say the FM radio that you might be used to hearing, which is of the order of a million oscillations per second. This one is more of the order of several hundreds of uh, billions of oscillations per second. I don't know if anybody else would like to add something to this introduction. I think you've covered it, Sammy. If not, then I think uh, that that was about all I wanted to say about it. Okay. The only other thing that that that's uh, useful is, of course, uh, um, you have a certain amount of angular resolution uh, with optical light. Um, you, it's not particularly uh, amenable to you know doing things like interferometry directly, although uh, some of that is now being attempted as well. Uh, with radio radio astronomy techniques using the radio waves, you can you can actually spread out telescopes uh, further apart and then uh, use the phase coherence of the uh, signals coming in to to get higher resolution images, which is uh, of which this is a particularly fine example. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next one's going to be fielded up to Dr. Remagen. Um, is there any information we've learned about Sagittarius A star through this image that can be used to search for other black holes? Uh, or are there any smoking guns? Well, it's interesting that we're actually able now um, to image a black hole. So uh, EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope, was first proposed as a, as a new uh, facility for from the National Science Foundation, where we can combine all these radio telescopes in the world to make the highest resolution image possible. They actually can only target these two black holes, the one at the center of M87 and the one in Sag A star. The only way that we're going to really image additional black holes using this technique is we're going to have to add more dishes into the array in order to get the sensitivity to actually investigate uh, other black holes in the universe. So there's a lot here about Sag A star that we still don't understand. You got to remember that this is, you know, this is looking at an image of something that was first thought of in the early 1900s as a theoretical curiosity. Could something actually form to have a density high enough that light would not even escape it? And this is the first time we're actually seeing the real evidence, not, you know, real evidence for material that is falling into the event horizon of a black hole. So there's a lot of information here in this image, um, even though it kind of just looks like a donut with a couple blobs. But the idea is that there's so much information that we're now able to learn from just this image and from the image of N87 to help refine our theories of general relativity, to actually look for other pieces of evidence around other black holes um, that we could search for, but we're going to need technology developments and enhancements to look for these other black holes because the EHT um, was only built to search for these particular telescopes because they are the brightest objects that we could actually see given this current te uh, technology. So the smoking guns, um, we see um, a very bright ring around um, the event horizon as this material is falling into the black hole. That is a smoking gun that we've had. All other previous evidence has been circumstantial. We've seen stars orbiting around something very, very massive at the center, but we never really could actually image what was going on at the very center of these uh, objects. Now we have the capability to do that. Thank you. Uh, this one will also go to you as well. Um, what unknowns are we still looking for in either Sagittarius A star or M87 star? Uh, M87 star being the previous, previously released image of a black hole uh, in the M87 galaxy. There's a lot of them. Um, we don't fully know their orientation. How, what's their inclination angle? We don't know how the material is flowing into it. Um, we don't know um, the black hole spin. There's a lot of information here that we're still looking into. Um, what we're comparing with these images are our understanding of our models of black holes. And we have come up with the best idea of what the black hole looks like based on those models. But there's a lot more information that we still need. The next images that should be coming out have to do with something called polarization 
And so you can see the image here from um, N87 um, from that black hole where we started looking at polarization and polarization is how the light coming from this object is actually um, oriented um, in a way, is it coming toward you? Um, is, it, um, is, the light, is the light wave kind of oriented at an, um, at an angle to you? Um, polarization tells us a lot uh, also about the black hole and what it, and um, the characteristics that it has. So there's a lot of unknowns that we have. Like I said, this is only two black holes. We have only a sample two now that we've been investigating so far. So there's a lot of questions that we have. Our theories look good. General relativity is, is holding strong here and understanding all this stuff, but there's a lot of information on spin, polarization, um, um, how the material is falling into the black hole that still need to be determined. So we can see the image of M87 star up on the screen right now. Um, how are Sagittarius A star and M87 star similar and how are they different? I will give you one word, mass. And I'm going to leave it at that. The mass, the mass of the M87 black hole is orders of magnitude, several tens and thousands of times more massive than at the center of our own galaxy. Um, that's that is the most fundamental difference between these two these two black holes. The other piece of evidence that we think we have is that the M87 black hole seems to be more edge on when we're looking at its event horizon. Its material is kind of falling into it. The Sag A star black hole is actually more face on, so we're kind of seeing the material. Um, orbit around it instead of um, those are the two biggest differences is mass and orientation right now and it's still a big mystery why the MA, why the Sag A star black hole is oriented um, kind of face on to us in our galaxy um, because the it's it's uh, it's perpendicular to the actual plane of the galaxy itself so those are the two biggest things um, that are similar and dissimilar between the two black holes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this one will be fielded out to Dr. Saney or Dr. Hawkins. Um, how did the EHT function as a virtual telescope? Uh, how did you combine data from numerous observatories across the globe? I can take this one if you want. So uh, this used interferometry, uh, which is a, it's a, uh, a development in radio astronomy. You can imagine if you have an array of antennas and there's something out in space emanating a, um, a signal. And if you're able to keep track of the slight difference in time or phase that that signal hits all these antennas at different times, uh, you could say something about where that thing was, right? There's a range of spots in the universe where something would give you that phase or time difference. Now imagine doing it for something like 27 antennas you see there on the screen and letting the earth rotate and orbit and you get all these different looks and you can accumulate all these differences. And if you're very uh, methodical about keeping track of all these phases and you're very precise, uh, you can inverse the problem. You can figure out what, what array of uh, signals out there in space was causing all these different um, phase differences and time differences with your antennas. It's, uh, it's similar to what they do in uh, CAT scans or MRIs where they have an array of uh, of um, uh, sensors looking at uh, signals coming uh, from within your body and you have to figure out the array of those. So that's what EHT used. In this case, you see the elements of it. Um, and they all focused uh, as a single, and each one of them was a single antenna, but they're phased up and looking at all the different phases uh, that were coming across all these. And because of the long baselines, you can get very, very precise measurements uh, of the locations of things. And, uh, of space where these signals are emanating from. So I'll talk about in a few minutes about the, the, the way we timed these things and the, and the atomic uh, measures we had to use to do this. But in effect, you're just looking at the difference in time arrival and phase difference uh, at a very small time scale. And you can inverse what you're receiving and figure out what, uh, what is out there causing, um, causing those signals at your uh, antennas. Thank you. Uh, a different user follows up this question by asking, how dissimilar are the elements of the, uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope Assembly? Uh, it seems like there would be an endless list of small inconsistencies that would cause all sorts of compounding issues in such a precise observation. Uh, and as a follow-up, what was the diff biggest difficulty in integration? Uh, that one will go out to Dr. Remesha. Well, let's see. They're all radio telescopes and they're all operating at the same frequency. That's that's basically what we did. The EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium, basically 
working with the, the Central Development Lab here and uh, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and also other labs around the world, tried to put together a, a suite of receivers that could be delivered at each one of these facilities so they could all observe at the same wavelengths and frequencies. Then they, all then they delivered clocks to each one of these observatories so they could all keep very accurate timing. So if you had those two things, if you had a very accurate clock to measure when the signals were coming in and they were all observing at the same frequencies, um, then computers are pretty good at combining all these signals together. But you're right, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of small inconsistencies within the receivers, the size of the dishes, these kind of things that kind of are built in that we have to, you know, take into account when we do the signal processing, taking all these data together and actually making an image and, and interpreting the data. Biggest problem we have is we have to make sure that every single site across the entire globe had good weather. Because if one or two of the sites go out, then that really um, makes a poor image because we really need all these telescopes working together to make the final image that you saw there. So the biggest problem that we came into was weather. The weather had to be good all the way across the globe in order to make this final image. So that's really what we were, that's really what we were up against. And ALMA that you see on the screen here was absolutely critical of this. ALMA provide the long baselines down to uh, South America and the sensitivity needed by combining all these radio telescopes together to act as one big single dish in order to really anchor the entire set of observatories around the world. You can see where ALMA here is this image, you know, kind of anchoring there in South America compared to the South Pole Telescope and to the Northern Hemisphere telescopes providing the, the, the sensitivity uh, needed in order to make these final images, both of M87 and uh, the Sag A star. Without ALMA, you cannot make these images. And that's why we absolutely needed this uh, array of telescopes around the world and to include ALMA in order to make this groundbreaking discoveries. Thank you. Another one for you. What doors for research have opened up as a result of this image? Well, if you want to do, excuse me, if you want to do um, experiments in general relativity, this is the place to be. So all of all of the um, um, the theories of general relativity that Einstein postulated back in the early 1900s, this is really the most extreme test of general relativity. But also interestingly enough is signal processing and image reconstruction. <clears throat> what you're doing here is you're trying to create an image of something with a lot of information that's missing. So take a digital camera, let's say a million pixels and remove 900,000 of them and you have 100,000 pixels left and say, well, reconstruct an image using only that limited number of pixels. It's gonna be very, very difficult to do that. And so this is what, you know, signal processing, this is what, you know, image reconstruction, all these techniques in computer science are needed in order to help generate pictures like this because we have incomplete data. So Bert and, um, was talking about all these telescopes distributed all over the world. That's great. They're adding a lot of resolution, but there's a lot of space between those telescopes that are not filled in. And with all that missing space in between, you know, where you have to determine what goes there. And so the, the whole process of using the data that we have in order to reconstruct the image that you see, um, this is a whole new area of research that has been, uh, that has been opened up here um, in order to compare the theory to the data to actually make that final image. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit how the, about how the Central Development Laboratory contributed to the production of this image. Yes, uh, the CDL has some core technology areas we, we study, and uh, those have been very important for the EHT. Um, perhaps the most important uh, is the receiver used, the band six receiver, uh, which Sandy talked about, operates at uh, wavelengths just longer than a millimeter. Um, we built those for all the AMA uh, telescope um, uh, antennas used for the HT and several other telescopes. So at the heart of this receiver is a superconducting uh, device called an SIS junction built by our partners at the University of Virginia. And it's the most sensitive detector at these wavelengths uh, in, in the world. Um, so we had to produce enough of those to cover all the uh, in, uh, antennas on ALMA and a, and a few other parts of, um, of the HT. So uh, we're very proud of that. Um, the other uh, part is the so-called local oscillator. This is a signal you generate uh, yourself uh, to multiply with the incoming signal in order to bring it down to frequencies low enough so that you can digitize it 
and do all that processing that Tony just talked about, uh, reconstructing the image. Um, we also have a very good local oscillator team that, that knows how to build oscillators and they have to be extremely stable again because we're talking about very small changes in frequency and timing. Uh, so we built those as well for Alma. Um, perhaps most importantly also was the correlator, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the device that does the resolution. Now we, we built the one for Alma, another uh, technique was used for the EHT. But uh, we leveraged the uh, correlator work we did for Alma to help phase Alma up into an array. I think we'll talk about that uh, in a few more minutes. So everything from the receiver uh, to the oscillator to down convert the signal so it could be digitized um, to the correlator. And one other thing we added to Alma at, uh, at CDL was a hydrogen maser um, to take the internal timing mechanism of Alma and convert it to the global uh, timing mechanism that EHT used. Uh, thank you. Uh, a little bit, Dr. Saini, can you talk a little bit about Alma bands? I'm sorry, my did my internet cut out? It may have. It did, but I think we're okay. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to repeat my question. Dr. Saini, would you mind talking a little bit about Alma Band 6 and why it's important? All right. So, <clears throat> Bert already described, uh, you know, how the Alma telescope was involved in this and um, why is Band 6 important? So, before I go into just Band 6, uh, I'll, I'll briefly give an introduction on what all these bands are about. So, as in the introductory part, I was describing that there are certain frequencies that make it through the atmosphere and then there are certain ones which are blocked. So what ALMA has done is it has divided, it has looked at all of these frequencies, um, you know, all the way from about you know, 27 gigahertz all the way up to 960 or so odd gigahertz and figured out the various, uh, you know, ranges that uh, the atmosphere is transparent to. And there are, they have roughly divided them into 10, 10 windows, which we call bands. And so this band six, as we call it, is the band which spans roughly 210 to about uh, 270 gigahertz or so. And uh, in the atmosphere has a very good transmission at, at, at this frequency range. So as uh, Tony was describing, um, there are certain factors that have to be satisfied simultaneously in order to make an image like, like we have here. One, all the receivers should be working at the same frequency, obviously. They should be looking at the same thing at the same frequency. The weather has to be good everywhere. And, uh, and uh, you know, technologically, everything has to work at that point of time when the weather is good. So, so that's, um, so band six, this 230 gigahertz or 1.3 millimeter wave, uh, millimeter uh, spectrum was chosen for this work. And uh, band six uh, obviously covers that. Uh, so the the importance of band six here is that not only is this a receiver that is available on all of the Alma telescopes, but similar receivers are available uh, on all the other uh, you know partner telescopes across the world, and some of those receivers, um, the hardware for that has also been supplied by by the NRA or by the Central Development Lab. So basically, they're just sister receivers which are very similar to the one uh, one used on Alma. Um, so uh, another thing that Tony was mentioning is that you have uh, think uh, think of this as a digital camera with lots of pixels removed and you have only a few pixels remaining. So obviously these few pixels that remain, you want them to be you know fairly sensitive because you're trying to uh, pick up uh, signals which are fairly weak. So you do not want the noise of the electronics to interfere with the actual signal from the sky. It's sort of like trying to pick up a weak, uh, um, a weak AM radio station uh, above your, uh, um, you know, uh, radio receiver static. So these receivers, these band six receivers that we have, are so sensitive that uh, their noise floor level is uh, of the order of uh, three or four um, photons at this frequency. So, so uh, if 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 four or five photons of uh, light fall on, on this receiver, uh, well, uh, we can detect that. So, so these are extremely sensitive receivers. Uh, um, and uh, uh, and uh, 
the, the imaging that was done with this is, uh, as we were talking just before this um, you know, live stream started, so it's, it's, it's basically using the total power over the, over the bandwidth that it's observing at to, to come up with the image. So I think that gives you a, an idea as to you know, the importance of, of, of this band six receiver uh, uh, to this particular project. Okay, just to, just to clarify a bit there, can you talk a little, a little bit about the difference between four or five photons hitting a receiver or just one or many? What, what's the process in distinguishing that like? So uh, what happens is that uh, the noise process in electronics is, is fairly well understood at this point. Uh, so uh, as you would imagine, uh, anything that is above absolute zero, uh, you know, the material uh, is at some physical temperature that shakes its electrons inside. And because electrons are charges and they are moving around, then that basically creates a, a noise waveform. And that noise waveform will then interfere with the signal that you're receiving and will corrupt it. So you obviously, this noise is unwanted and you want to minimize it. So, so some of the, so, so you want a receiver that has the minimum noise possible, right? So, uh, so one of the techniques that is used here is we use, um, so, so one way to simply reduce the noise is to cool the electronics, right? So that will kind of calm down the electrons so they won't shake that much. And so these receivers, uh, uh, very generally speaking, uh, kind of employ that technique. Uh, uh, these receivers are actually cooled down to uh, just uh, four degrees above absolute zero. And that enables the superconducting part of the receiver to uh, whose critical temperature is about four Kelvin, five Kelvin, to, to become superconducting. And so that kills off all the you know, resistances in the path and that reduces the noise. So, so, um, so, so some of the you know audience would uh, would know a, a single photon is a is is the is the minimum power that you can have because all of these things are quantized. So you cannot have a power level in the universe which is smaller than one photon. And our receivers are sensitive enough to where we can basically detect a power level which is you know four times that quantum limit. So pretty sensitive receivers. It would be hard to uh, you know uh, it, these can still be improved of course, but it would be hard to kind of improve them by orders of magnitude. At this point, the receiver noise temperature would only be improved by you know <laughs> another factor of twenty five percent or so, something like that, because you're just counting photons at this point. Yep. What's the next step for band six? So uh, as good as the band six is, um, believe it or not, uh, we actually have a project under, uh, under process where we are developing the next generation of this. So um, uh, of course, um, you know, the existing, the, the, these receiver noise temperatures are actually measured in terms of equivalent physical temperature of a, you know, a resistor that would generate an equivalent amount of noise. So the existing receivers are equivalent to about um, you know, 83 Kelvin uh, physical temperature. Uh, what we are trying to do to build a new receiver is to actually lower that down to about 53 Kelvin or so. So, so that would be a significant improvement that uh, reduces the receiver noise. Also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the image that we saw of the black hole was actually a continuum image uh, using the bandwidth that is available from the existing receiver, which is not very large. The existing receiver only has an IF bandwidth of about you know four to five gigahertz. So any improvement in that uh, uh, bandwidth would also be of help. So this new receiver that we are working on not only has a lower uh, receiver noise temperature, but also we are trying to expand the IF bandwidth from about five gigahertz or so to, 20, uh, to almost about 20 gigahertz. So you'll get a factor of four improvement there. Um, uh, those are actually the tall pole items for this new receiver. So um, it will have, uh, it will go through its development stages, which, which are obviously time consuming because this is all very intricate and delicate work. Um, and uh, uh, the first prototypes uh, for this new receiver are expected to roll off in about, uh, you know, three to four years time when, and eventually we'll upgrade the entire ALMA array with these new receivers and remove the old ones and uh, refurbish them. Thank you.
Um, Dr. Hawkins, can you talk a little bit about the transformations Alma underwent to participate in the AHD? Sure, yeah, there's a few things we had to do. First of all, we had to uh, take Alma out of being an interferometer upon itself and just being a single antenna, if you will, subsumed into the uh, EHT uh, interferometer. So that involved rewinding all those uh, uh, calculations and the, uh, and the computer work we talked about earlier about forming an array with Alma. So we had to phase it up. So instead of exploiting all the differences in timing and phase uh, that all the uh, various antennas had, we had to erase those. So it looked like one single antenna. So this is a so-called Alma phasing project. Um, which is not easy to do. Um, you know the location of the antennas, so it's to a first order, you can erase all those differences because you know where you're looking in the sky. But these wavelengths, they're minute and rapid time varying changes in the phase caused by atmosphere water moving around. So you have to constantly measure that and then adjust for it on a, on a fine time scale. So we had to develop a system to measure that and then uh, using the LO system I talked about earlier and a, and, a, and a filter system, we had to dynamically alter these uh, these phase changes so that again, all those antennas on Alma were not an interferometer within themselves, but they were a single antenna. Um, but that was very important because Alma has a huge collecting area. Uh, it's like uh, Tony said earlier, it's an order of magnitude greater than the other elements in the EHT. So um, that Alma phasing project was very important. That involved uh, changes in hardware and software, in effect, building a whole new uh, correlator, if you will. Uh, the other thing we had to do was make sure that uh, in order to sum up all these signals across this huge array, you have to make sure you're exquisitely timed across that array. Um, and we had to add a hydrogen uh, maser uh, to Alma and then sync it up with the internal Alma time timing system. The, um, the VLBI, VLBI data exchange format that EHT used was looking for pulses once per second, uh, but very precise pulses at once per second. So that's what we added the, uh, the, uh, the atomic clock for. And then we synced that up with the internal um, uh, ALMA uh, clock in order to make it uh, line up with all the other elements of the EHT. And then finally, uh, we had to install a bank of recorders to record this data. Um, uh, and because it was just too much data to transmit across any sort of a, a line. So it had to be, uh, we had to add fiber optic cables and we had to add recorders and, and record that. And then all that was sent to the EHT and they gathered up all these uh, recordings from the various elements and that's uh, resulted in the image you see. Um, it took about three years to do these changes to Alma um, at a cost of about $4 million from a grant from NSF. So it occupied a large part of uh, CDL's uh, digital and uh, band six workforce for a few years, but the result was outstanding. Agreed. Um, uh, for Dr. Imogen, at, at millimeter scale wavelength and such a precise target, are there any additional error sources that come into play that amateur radio astronomy can typically ignore? And what was the most unexpected roadblock in the imaging pipeline? Well, for amateur radio astronomy, um, I think that the what uh, Sani was talking about in terms of having to cool the receivers down to such a cold temperature so we could actually receive all the photons and reduce the noise as much as possible is really what, um, really what we're trying to do here. You know, noise, noise in the system, noise in your receiver, you know, the static that you hear on the radio when you kind of turn to a station that isn't, that isn't broadcasting at, um, at a particular frequency, you know, we want to really reduce that. We want to, we want to get that as small as possible. So the, you know, the error that comes into that for, for any kind of noise in our system is detrimental to making images such as this. So, you know, when you, and when you talk about an imaging pipeline, uh, for radio astronomy, because you have uh, a lot of these data, especially here at the EHT, that is missing because you don't, uh, you're, you're missing those pixels um, in a that you just don't have because you don't have antennas all the way around the world at every single distance from each other in order to fill in all that information. You're interpolating a lot um, in, of what that image is going to look like. Now, the image characteristics tell you a lot about um, is it a disc? Is it a ring? Does it, is it uh, a point source? Does it have structure uh, at different distances and, and how big it is? So it does constrain things a little bit, but for making an image that you see here, it takes a lot of um, 
comparisons to the models and um, comparisons to theoretical uh, data that were put in in order to reconstruct and make the image look like it, like what we finally concluded to. So as you see on this image, right, you know that that was part of the part of the press conference and that was part of the actual um, publications in the papers. The the bottom four panels that you see here are actually consistent with data that we collected from the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and what they did was that you, they looked at all of these images together and came up with the best fit image. So is this exactly 100% what every single you know, feature looks like in, um, in the black hole? Probably not, but it is, we are very confident that this is the overall structure of the black hole that we see right now. <laughs> it's no different than when Galileo first looked at you know, mountains on the moon or the Galilean satellites that he was making. He did the best that he could by looking at these uh, objects with that technology at the time and said, okay, this is what I think is going on and he started writing those things down and making conclusions uh, based on those on, on what he saw through the telescope. We're doing the exact same thing here. It's the first time we've ever seen this. And we have a lot of good theories. We got a lot of good background mathematical understanding of what's going on. But we're gonna, you know, we're gonna need <clears throat> the additional information from new band six receivers, from going to higher frequencies, from possibly including new uh, facilities into the array to actually test some of these theories further to make sure that we are actually um, uh, making the best image possible of, of what's going on at the center of our galaxy. <clears throat> Thank you. I think we're going to open up the rest of these to, to a wider response group. But so anyone, if you want to respond, please feel free. Um, do we have a polarization image yet? Uh, the user asks or thinks, hopes it might be sharper and more detailed than the polarization image of M87 star. So I'll take this one. I, I think they're working on it. Um, full polarization data was taken. And like I said, you know, light is intrinsically, um, you know, polarized when it's, um, depending on how we actually receive it through the telescopes, you could actually, you know, call out the specific polarizations when you actually observe these objects. Um, they do have it there. I believe they're still working on it. And that's uh, um, for a future, for a future work. What we are looking at from the previous set of observations from the previous images is just the total image, the total flux that's coming from that source, not the polarized light that's coming from the source. So I think they're working on it. I don't know if when, you, when you talk about being sharper or, or more detailed, I don't have that information yet in front of me. Um, they're still working on it. Yeah, I think what we have on the screen right now is not uh, the SAG star, but this is the M87 black hole. And this one, I think they did do some polarized studies and that's uh, one of the images corresponding to that. Yes, that's correct. Did we lose Teddy? You there, Teddy? Sorry. If you'll just uh, bear with us momentarily, we're having some technical difficulties. We'll be back in just just a moment. Tony, there was the question about direction of spinning, uh, which may be related to the um, polarization question where someone asked it looked like the spinning uh, yeah, um, here in M87. So we are still streaming. We're, We're still streaming, streaming, right. The, what, what I have to, I have to be, you know, as, as Teddy introduced me at the beginning here, I'm an observational astrochemist. Um, and, and so my, my knowledge of black holes is, is kind of limited here. And spin is one of these characteristics of black holes that I'm not too familiar with. Um, it, is a, it is a physical property of a black hole. And, you know, that actually the, the amount of spin actually depends on the overall size of the event horizon. I know, I know that for a fact, but what, what 
to try to characterize it as if the black hole itself is actually like rotating, like you would think of a, like a top or a planet rotating, I would need to talk to one of my black hole colleagues to actually understand this because we also talk about spin when we talk about molecules. We talk about spin, we talk about electron spin and those kind of things. And we kind of have an idea of, you know, things spinning on an axis. What we should think about is that black holes or any object, you know, whether it's a molecule, an atom, an electron, or, or anything else in the universe, it may carry some angular momentum with it. And so there's a certain amount of angular momentum, you know, a certain amount of rotational, what you want to call it, energy that is contained within a black hole. And, and so there's a angular momentum, you know, a certain amount of rotational, what you want to call it, energy that is contained within a black hole. And, and so there's a certain angular momentum, you know, a certain amount of rotational, what you want to call it, energy that is contained within a black hole. And, and so there's a certain angular momentum, you know, a certain amount of rotational, what you want to call it, energy that is contained within a black hole. And, and so there's a I'm sorry, we're keep getting a, a repeat here. Um, I don't know how to stop this. I'm hearing a repeat. Yeah, hang on. Sorry, we're keep getting a repeat here. Oh, Lord. Is that one playing sound? It stopped. Shall we try to continue? We could try. All, uh, yeah, all I was trying to, uh, we could just close by saying that there's a, um, there is this thing called intrinsic spin. Um, it is different in the M87 black hole than it is compared to the Sagi star black hole. It has to do with the relative size of the event horizon. However, I don't know that much more about it. I have to be perfectly honest with you. So um, something that we could, we could definitely find out more information on. I can, I can pick up on a question that's, that's come in. Um, someone asked about um, what NREO telescopes or instrumentation were part of the HD collaboration outside of Alma, I talked about all the Alma uh, components we built. Um, there were three other telescopes part of EHT that housed NRAO and CDL technology. It was the submillimeter telescope in Arizona, the large millimeter telescope in Mexico, and the South Pole telescope. For all, for all of these, we supplied that superconducting mixer I talked about earlier, um, as well as some other uh, components integral to the receiver. So. You know, that speaks to the fact that the community uh, shares uh, technology and capabilities, and also to the fact that uh, it took a lot of engineering and coordination to bring, uh, you know, technologies built at different locations together uh, and get them all to work together under a clear sky, as you mentioned, Tony, on one day. Okay, we're back. Sorry, we had some uh, internet difficulties there. Um, I'm guessing we, can you point me out to which question we just finished? We kind of went through the spin of a black hole, um, or talked a little bit about, you know, the technologies that were sent to other facilities around from NRAO. Um, I was just going to start talking a little bit about, you know, making a picture with 3D or making a movie, because that's the next big thing on the EHT's uh, list of things to do is to try to make a movie of Yes, yeah, so I was going to. I have that question flagged to ask uh, at a later point, which is yes, they're claiming to be work toward, working towards a movie. Can you talk about why that might change the way we think about Sagittarius A star? Well, the the idea is um, the the scale at which material is falling into the black hole um, is changing on hours uh, when we look at it here in the uh, galactic center. So material is moving incredibly fast. Um, in fact, there are movies made of stars orbiting around. Sag A star uh, taking over several months and, and years that actually you can actually see the orbits of these stars um, um, orbiting around the central black hole. 
So this is gonna give us, um, when we can make this movie and actually look at the time variability, how the material and is falling in, you know, how it's orbiting around the black hole. Um, that's gonna give us more information about the overall structure of the black hole uh, itself, a little bit more about the physics and dynamics of the black hole um, as we're gonna actually, as we're gonna see these, um, uh, as we're gonna see this material kind of orbiting and falling into the black hole. 3D images are hard in astronomy for a lot of reasons, right? We don't have a very good measure of that, you know, depth co uh, comparison um, when we do things. Um, so it's, it, it is going to be much more difficult to make, let's say, a 3D image of this. But I, 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 um, I've been astounded by what our EPO team and what the data has been able to tell us over the course of the last several years of some other objects. Um, you know, evolved stars in our galaxy where we could actually kind of walk through the shell of an evolved star and see what's going on in, in three dimensions. So um, I'm sure that there will be some kind of um, determination of, of the depth um, of the black hole here. So it'll be fun to see what happens over the course of the next several years. Very exciting. Um, this, this user wants to know that given that Sar Sag A star's event horizon is about 19 micro arc seconds across, do the event horizon telescopes need to have a pointing accuracy of that order? What is the value of the pointing accuracy of most event horizon telescopes? Oh, I can start off uh, making some comments here. So, so what you so, you know, the overall, the EHT, uh, it's, it's, of course, if you are using a single dish telescope, uh, you want it to be uh, the pointing accuracy to be, um, and that's where the pointing accuracy comes from. That uh, when you are looking um, spot on onto the source, you want the output to be the peak, and then as soon as you move off from the center, you want it to drop off rapidly. Uh, and so, of course, if there is an error in pointing accuracy, then 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 your image either becomes inaccurate or becomes fuzzy, if 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 that's how you want to think about it. Um, and now, of course, you can uh, you can make make the beam sharper or uh, you know more narrow by either increasing the you know diameter of the dish. Uh, or by moving to higher frequencies, in which case also the response drops off as soon as you move off from the center. The EHT achieves the same goal because the resolution required is much, much larger than what can be done with a single dish by actually having multiple dishes um, you know, separated as Bert and Tony were describing uh, across the face of the earth. And, 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 and then you, you, you know, drop off of the, uh, the peak signal when you move away from your source uh, very rapidly. Yeah. But all of that is virtual. Of course, you're doing uh, you know, processing offline. So uh, in, in that sense, it's not the pointing accuracy of any single telescope that needs to be of that order of magnitude, but it's essentially the synthesized telescope that, that, that we should, and that, that should be able to, uh, you know, uh, synthesize a, a pointing accuracy of that extent. And then that can actually be achieved, um, you know, by mm, doing the baselines accurately and by having your timestamps be accurately recorded and having a correlator that can process all of the data uh, correctly with respect to it and apply the correct phases. So uh, with that introduction, maybe Tony wants to add some comments to that. Just, just the fact that realize this is one of the highest precision, um, one of the highest um, sharpest images ever made. Okay, I think that was said at the actual press conference. So, you know, we're kind of blowing in, you know, you know, zooming in here. But I mean, in terms of the resolution that we have found here um, for this particular image, it's remarkable. And so, and it's the first image of a black hole, everyone. Well, sorry, the second image of a black hole. So just be impressed by that. Yeah, it's like a tennis ball on the moon. Um, so that, unfortunately, is the end of our Ask Me Anything. Um, so I want to thank all of our guests for being here today. Um, and I want to congratulate all the members, uh, both in the science side and the development side over at CDL, um, for the amazing work that you all put together in producing this I mean, monumental occasion. We now know what it looks like at the very center of our galaxy. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming out today uh, for this Ask Me Anything. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Bye.